can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, some of the past interviews you can check out, founder of P90X, founder of RX Bar, founder of Atari. They talk about not just the ups, but the downs and the journey. Um, this interview is a little bit different. This is, was for the Process Breakdown podcast that I did. It was so good that I had to release it on Inspired Insider, so stay tuned. Um, and before you get to it, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. What we do is at Rise25, we help B2B businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 partnerships and clients, and we help you run your podcast so it generates ROI. And the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships, a podcast for me over, over the past 10 years has allowed me to profile others thought leadership in companies and give to them and have them on my podcast and platform. So if you have questions about podcasting, go to rise25.com. You can watch a video. My business partner and I banter like an old married couple. Check out rise25.com. Thanks. Listen to the episode. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, host of the Process Breakdown Podcast, where we talk about streamlining and scaling operations of your company, getting rid of bottlenecks and giving your staff everything they need to be successful at their job, past guests. You can look at David Allen of Getting Things Done, Michael Gerber of the e myth of many more. Um, before I introduce today's guest who needs no introduction, if you should be getting his book, if you don't, I'm not going to say, John, they should be ashamed of themselves, but like you should, <laughs> should have gotten built to sell. And by the way, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Whether you want to sell your company or not, just having it in your business is, makes, is critical. So you can, you know, actually not stress out all the time. But before we get to that, this episode is brought to you by Sweet Process. If you have had team members ask you the same questions over and over again, and it's maybe the 10th time you spent explaining it, there's probably a better way, a better solution. Sweet Process is a software that makes it drop dead easy to train and onboard new staff and save time with existing staff. And John, I was talking to Owen, the founder, you know, he was telling me, you know, universities use it, banks use it, hospitals use it, but I didn't realize that there's some first responder government agencies that use it in life or death situations to run their operations. So you, you know, Sweet Process is to document all the repetitive tasks um, that eat up your precious time. You can sign up for a 14 day trial. There's no credit card required. Sweetprocess.com, S W E E T process. Um, today's guest, I'm super excited about. Um, John Worlow is the founder of the Value Builder System. And what it is, they, there's a cloud based assessment tool that business owners use to assess the sellability of their company. And John has helped more than 55,000 business owners improve their company value and get this by up to 71%. And I was reading, John, like if you go to, anyone can go to the, their site, valuebuildersystem.com slash score, and the people who score a certain amount um, are, have a much better you know, uh, sellability and, and increased sellability. So he's the author of Built to Sell, Creating a Business that Can Thrive Without You, which is recognized by the Fortune and Inc. as one of the best business books. And he also wrote The Automatic Customer, and he hosts Built to Sell Radio, where they interview founders about their exit journey. And um, before founding Value Builder System, John started and exited four companies. So, John, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, it's a pleasure. You know, I want to start, there's so many good stories, and, and I meant that. Everyone should, I don't care if someone says, I'm not, I'm not going to sell my company ever. Um, I don't know anyone who really says that actually, because sometimes they start with, I just want to sell my company and they haven't started the company yet. But, um, anyone, it's funny, Jeremy, I just did a, I yeah. just did a webinar yeah. and I was looking at the comments in the beginning. I surveyed people. I said, Hey, are you business owner looking to build value or do you want to sell? Cause I'd like to tailor my comments to the two. Yeah. And, and then in the comments, I was, I guess talking too much about selling your company because the guy said, I'm leaving. You're talking too much about selling. I'm leaving the webinar. And I thought, man, that guy's sensitive. But it's funny. People get very sensitive about the topic of selling their company. It's, it's like this taboo topic. I remember I was doing one interview with a guy who started off, I was doing a podcast with him. And he started off and he said, oh, you're the douchebag who wrote Built to Sell. 
I was like, what? And wow. that was the opening line. And it was this whole idea that- Does like, he need like a lesson on bond and rapport or something? Yeah, like, exactly. You don't he's open gotta, it. He's got to get the Jeremy lesson on building rapport. No, but this whole thing was like, you're, you know, like you're, you're propagating this idea that people should build to flip and real companies are built to last. And I, I just couldn't disagree more. My whole thing is build a company so that it, you could sell if you ever want to. And you don't yeah. have to sell, but yeah. man, you should build it like an asset as opposed to a job. Totally, because anyone who's putting the systems in place to sell their company means someone could take over and it starts to remove you. So you could, even if you're going to work on higher, I'm preaching the choir, work on higher level things, well, then you can go and do that, you know, and, and you talk about that and build the sell. You know, if anyone listens to, everyone should listen to it. But here's the thing, John, you, you could tell someone who you wrote it and you were in the trenches because I viscerally feel pain throughout the book when you're going through different scenarios. Um, and one of them is the scenario of the team and going to the team and saying, because there's a, a guilt there. When you go to the team and you tell them, they've helped me build this and now I'm going to sell, I'm going to cash out. Talk about the, approaching the conversation with the team and, and some of the thoughts on that. Man, it's, it's, it is arguably one of the most vexing challenges that a lot of entrepreneurs have is how do they tell their employees who many of whom are family members or they treat them as if they were family members that, Oh, by the way, I've just sold my company and this, this thing that we've all created together is no longer, uh, you know, independently owned. And look, here's the thing. I think you have to make a case as to how they benefit right? So believe it or not, when you walk in your office doors, they see the top of the rung in the career ladder, right? And that may be hard for you to hear and you may be a great boss, but at the same time, you're probably running a relatively small company. And for a lot of people, ambitious people on your team, they're going to want to get to the next rung on the ladder. And, and, and frankly, you're in their way. <laughs> so in some cases, the pitch is, look, I've I brought this company as far as I can, but man, you guys deserve more. You need a bigger company, a bigger field to play on, and this is going to enable us to do this. It's going to enable us to achieve our vision. I think you can't lie. You have to be authentic in what you, you've delivered. I think the other thing to, to talk about is, is to tell people, look, I'm, I'm looking to, to, to find an investor underscore the word investor as opposed to acquirer. I'm looking to find an investor who can get us to the next level. And if that conversation then morphs into an acquisition conversation, well, you, you weren't necessarily being disingenuous. You were looking for an investor that happened to expand. So I think there's some ways that you can, yeah. you can get around the conversation. But it, look, it's a challenging one. A lot of people feel yeah. betrayed when they, uh, when they find out. I, you know, I love the way you lay it out, painting that picture of how it's going to benefit them. And I think, you know, that that piece alone is worth the whole, you know, getting the book. But there's another piece. It's the subtleties of the language that you talk about in the book. And one is client versus customer. Mm. And that alone, I think, is like another was it sounds simple, but it's almost groundbreaking. And the well, first, so, yeah, talk about that. Yeah, that's a bit of a different idea in the sense that. Yeah. Um, service companies in particular, and built to sell is really about how do you take a service company and make it into a sellable asset. And service companies are usually, David Ogilvy said, you know, like the assets go up and down the elevator every night. There's no assets, there's no underlying trucks or infrastructure that, that you could sell. And so a lot of service company people think they don't really have much to sell. They may have something to sell, but it's contingent on making these big, bold changes to make the company able to succeed without you. And one of the ways to do that is to productize. And productizing is to make what you have today, even though it's a service, sound like it's a product, right? So in the book, there's a marketing services company that does everything under the sun, and he morphs the company into the five-step logo design process, right? And so it's a process, and it's got five steps, and it's all done always. So it feels very tangible. And part of that is the lexicon. And it sounds superficial to some people, but changing your vocabulary around the way you talk about your company can subtly communicate to an acquirer that you're more than just a collection of people doing service work. So for example, avoid the word client. No one's going to care if you call them customers, but companies, products have customers, service businesses have clients. Um, engagement is a service company word, right? Whereas a, you know, a, a project is, so there's some some very important words and lingo that you can make that change. 
Yeah. No, I thought that was an important piece of it. And it's like product versus service company and studying what the product companies do, because as you mentioned, you know, there is a higher valuation, right? For a service yeah. company versus a product company. You bet. I just did a, a, a podcast last week with a, a woman named Debbie King who ran a company called Association Analytics. So she was like in the, in the hamster wheel that most service companies find themselves in. She's, she does analytics for membership organizations and she focuses on you know, big projects. She would personally have to get involved in each. She built it to 20 employees, yet she was personally involved in every project because every project was different. It was a mess. She goes to an M&A guy and says, look, I, I want out. I'm dying. I'm tired. I, I want out. And the M&A guy looks across the table and says, Debbie, like, like, there's nothing that I can sell here. I mean, it's worthless. And, and Debbie's hearing this for the first time and her jaw drops, right? She's got 20 employees. She thinks she's sitting on a gold mine. And the guy goes, no, you got nothing. And I can't sell it. And so once she picks herself up from the mat, she goes and productizes her service. Instead of doing projects, she does a analytical dashboard. She creates a dashboard because she finds that a lot of these membership organizations have the same questions. And she puts it up in the cloud and she says, look, you subscribe to this dashboard, you upload your membership data and you can do all these queries. Who's likely to attrite, who's likely to buy more, who's likely to sponsor, et cetera. You can do all those queries on your own and it becomes a product. She morphs the, the entire business and ultimately sells for more than seven times EBITDA, wow. a very healthy product type multiple. Um, but yeah, it's all about moving from a, from a service company into more of a product yeah. that business. Yeah. And, and John, I want to talk about early on because you have a similar story when you yeah. first went to sell your business. <laughs> what, right. what, did, what did they tell you? What happened at that point? Yeah, it's a very similar story. We, we were doing custom market research. I mean, Debbie and I could be interchangeable. We were doing custom market research, big clients, big projects, but very unscalable, right? I was personally involved in doing a lot of the work. I built it up. I think we were at five or $6 million in annual revenue. We had clients like Microsoft and Bank of America and American Express, all these like blue chip clients. And so I go to this M&A guy. I'm like, I want to move to California. I'm done with this business. What do you think it's worth? And the guy looks at me and says, not much. Wow. <laughs> you know I mean, like that's shocking though. Devastating. Oh yeah. Very. I mean, it's like telling your child, you're the mom, the, ch the kid's ugly and that, you know, it's brutal. Uh, but you know, we, we made some big changes after that. I, I looked at well, what are the companies getting better valuations? And it turned out that the subscription based research companies, the likes of Gartner and Reuters and Thomson Reuters and, and Bloomberg were getting much better multiples because they'd morphed into a subscription service. And that's what inspired the change. And ultimately that company was acquired by one of the big subscription uh, services that um, ultimately now is called Gartner Group, which you know, based in Northeast. Wow. What were some, maybe one or two changes that you made initially that were really impactful that you know, okay, I need to shift. Yeah, the, the big one. And then I think the most important one and Debbie, by the way, did this as well at Association Analytics, is to niche down. Here's the problem. Hmm. When you're a service company, you have the luxury of morphing yourself for whoever you're in front of that day. You want it in red, no problem. You want it in green, you want it extra large, you want it, you can do all of the changes you want because you're listening to customers' objections and you can morph yourself because you're providing a service which is unique at every time. If you're gonna create a productized service, it's incumbent on you to niche way further down than you're naturally inclined to do. And so, because when you niche down, you can get to a point where a set of customers have a homogeneous need. And when you have a homogeneous need, you can then create a product to address that. If you're too squishy and, and too wide in terms of your product, your product is essentially going to be nothing to nobody because it's just going to be too insignificant to anybody. At Association Analytics, what Debbie did was she looked at her customers and said she had small associations, big, medium size. She realized the ones who would use this dashboard would have a consistent need for these running these analytics were large enough that they would not on their own be able to manage the customers in their head, right? Like if you've got 200 customers in a membership organization, you could pretty much manage them in your head, right? Or with a spreadsheet. She knew that once you reached 5,000 customers, 
it was way beyond anyone's ability to kind of member, remember people. So you needed analytics. And so her product was focused on, on membership organizations with at least 5,000 members. Guess what? That's a tiny subsegment of associations, but it enabled her to build a really compelling product. In our case, what we decided was we did research for Fortune 500 companies that wanted to reach the SMB market. So by definition, our target was Fortune 500 companies, of which there are 500, and then a subset of those which had a business-to-business -business offering, which is about 200 companies. So our entire addressable market in that company was 200 companies. Now, Did that charged, scare you at all when, when you saw that? Yeah, in the sense that we, well, we charged a lot for our subscriptions. We charged from sort of $40,000 to $200,000. So it wasn't like we knew that for each subscriber, we could capture lots of revenue. Um, but yeah, it meant that with the finite universe, you thought about prospects as not if they're going to buy, but when they're going to buy, right? So you knew the 200 companies you were going after. So it's like, okay, over the next 10 years, we want to go after those 200 customers. It was not like, oh, well, American Express said, no, that's too bad. I guess they're not a prospect. It's like, well, no, American Express said no today. So what are we going to do tomorrow to re-engage them? Was yeah. Because the, the addressable market was so small. Yeah. You know, you talk about this niching down and there's an exercise you have for a way to look at your business. I thought that was super valuable if you could share that because someone may have like a bunch of different customers. They're not sure who to zero in on. And you're saying right now, the most valuable thing you could do, figure out who your that ideal person is. And you have an exercise around, you know, how do you score things and, and how do you look at it? Yeah, we take all of our customers that go through Value Builder, this exercise called the Scalability Trifecta, which is really designed to figure out which of your services today have the potential to become productized. And so what you do is you write down a whole list of your products and services on a, on a piece of paper and you score them on three criteria. Number one is how teachable they are to employees. Talk about building process. This is right in the sweet spot of, of process building. Number one, how teachable they are to employees. Number two, how valuable they are to customers. The opposite of valuable is commoditized. Number three, how repeatable they are. So what kind of re repeatable, and I don't mean repeatable delivery process. I mean, what kind of repurchase cadence they have. In other words, the opposite of repeatable is like a wedding ring business, right? You buy them once or a funeral casket, whatever. What you yeah. want is something that is teachable to employees, unique coming from you, for i.e. your differentiator, it's valuable. Number three, it has a repeatable buying cadence, meaning customers need it on a regular basis. And you literally score all your services on these three criteria. Now, what you're going to find if you're anything like most of our customers who go through this exercise is that what's teachable competes with or is opposite to what is valuable, right? Those two things are opposite. Your most teachable things are also going to be the least valuable in the eyes of your customers. The most valuable is like your time, which is the least teachable, right? And so those two things compete naturally. When that happens, and I think it will in almost every case, when it happens, what you're going to do is identify something that's teachable as your starting base. That becomes your foundation and find a way to add something to it to make it unique. So you're going to start with what's teachable and then find something that takes it from a commoditized service into a differentiated one. I'll give you an example. So the HVAC space is a, a very interesting business, lots of small businesses doing heating and air conditioning, right? Well, in that space, you've got the concierge service where every three months you show up and you change the customer's furnace filter, right? And you charge 20 bucks a month and this gives you kind of proprietary access. We subscribe to, for that. Yeah, yeah we, we subscribe, subscribe for that. Yeah. Do you? Okay. Yeah, exactly. You got in Chicago, <laughs> we got in Toronto. Very they come every right? couple of months. Exactly. Yeah. But here's the problem. While it's teachable to t teach like some kid out of school how to do the furnace filter, it's also not very valuable. And more, I could like Chicago where you are, Jeremy, um, you've got lot, dozens of HVAC companies offering the same thing. So how do you make it unique? Well, what you could do is you could think about you know, what, what is the subset of customers that I want to serve and what do they specifically need and what could I do? So for example, um, I happen to have a son who, who suffers from asthma. Mm. So for us, if an HVAC company came in, in addition to changing the furnace filters, came in with an air quality measure 
that's been endorsed by the American Lung Association that says, hey, we've done the levels of dust and pollutants in the air. And just to give you peace of mind, this quarter you're scoring in the green in all five of these categories. Boom. That's a differentiated HVAC service, hmm. still a concierge service, still the basic, but yeah. I would, how many more, how many multiples of a traditional would I pay for that as a father of someone who has asthma, right? Many multiples. Um, and so that's a way you, I mean, that's a silly example, but you could differentiate a service by adding something to it. Right? Yeah. So do the exercise, it's called scalability finder, but when you find what's teachable and, and valuable competing with each other, start with teachable, then add something unique, yeah. something fresh, something different. Yeah, no, I love that. And do you get, you know, I'm wondering how you shift a business owner's mindset like, like Debbie, who's like the most valuable thing is me going in and doing it, shifting it to, well, how do I make this a, was that a hard process for her to go through in her mind to go, okay, I need to create a software out of what's in my head. It's, it seems like you get pushback um, on that a little bit because like, how can, you know, it's also maybe an ego thing. Like no one else could do what I do. Um, and how do I productize it or quantify it? How do you get them over that mindset shift that no, we can actually boil. I mean, you have a software yourself, right? Yeah. Like what well, yeah. you created over decades, right? And your knowledge is going into software, but I don't know. Talk about how do you get people over that mindset shift? Like, okay, you're special, but maybe not that special. We can, make it into uh, something that's repeatable. Yeah. You know, is it Tony Robbins who was the first one to talk about, you know, you either go away from pain or towards pleasure. It's the only I know he talks about it a lot, like I'm pain sure versus pleasure. Person. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think that's true. So I think the, the customer has to feel some pain and the pain Debbie felt. And I think the pain I felt as well. And the pain I think most owners reach at some point in their, in their career journey is it's too painful to stay and it's too painful to go. Meaning she got the word from an M&A professional that there's nothing here for me to, to, to sell. So yeah. here she is building a 20 employee company, her life's work, and she'd have to leave it and get nothing, right? So that's painful. Yeah. Equally, it was as painful for her to stay because she felt trapped in her business. She couldn't grow up beyond 20 employees because there's only so much of her time to go around, right? So she's trapped. And if there's anything I know about entrepreneurs is we hate feeling confined, right? It's like, we're, it's like the one thing that makes us entrepreneurs, right? Like we don't go to work for Procter & Gamble. We didn't go to work for Ford. We don't wanna be a little widget in, on the ladder that gets to, that's just not who, that's not the way we're wired, right? we don't like feeling confined and trapped. And so that feeling of being trapped in your business, I think is a struggle. Yeah. What I also talk a little bit about is to really think about your goals as an entrepreneur, because for most of us, when you say kind of, what are your goals next year? What we hear is entrepreneurs chasing a top line revenue or sales number or a bottom line profit number. Those are the two most common, you know, uh, yardsticks that owners are chasing. And what I encourage owners to think about, what I would encourage anyone listening to this to think about is, is instead of using those as your goals, I want you to think about your role as a parent, right? We talked about this before we hit record, Jeremy, the, the, the idea of being a parent is like our most important job. And for many of us, you know, when we start as parents, we do everything for our kids, right? We feed them, we change their diapers, like they don't have a single decision to make because we do it all for them, right? But over time, as they become teenagers and young adults, the goal that we have for them is that they can succeed on their own, right? That we, over time, give them enough exposure to actually get up on their own feet and succeed. And so what I ask entrepreneurs to think about is instead of chasing some profitability number or revenue number, I want you to think about your business as a child. And your goal as the founder is to get that child to adulthood safely, right? And not come live at home after college. No, exactly. <laughs> on your own, or, you know, like freedom to fly, whatever. Um, you know, get it to, to, to succeed without you. And yeah. process is a big part of that, right? Documenting your process is a huge part of that. But there's, you know, there's more to it, but that's a huge part of creating mm. something that can succeed without you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a metric, you know, you're saying the metric isn't necessarily 
top line or bottom line, but it's a freedom. It's like a, a freedom piece to be able to step away from the day to day. Yeah, you bet. I mean, again, it, 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 if you want to be hard nosed about it, a company that can thrive without the owner is the most valuable company. And you could build a very large company. Um, and if it's deeply dependent on you, it's not really worth very much, no matter how blue chip the clients are, how much profit you make. Uh, so again, thinking about your business as a child you need to raise, I, I think gets you there in the end, gets you to be a valuable, you know, uh, it, it increases your, your overall financial picture if that's what you're chasing, but it does it in a more nuanced, I think faster way. Yeah. I want to talk about, you know, some big mistakes uh, people make. And I know in the book, one of the big mistakes that the person makes is telling the person who's buying him that he's just ready to get out of here and yeah. move on. So I would talk about that, but like any other big mistakes that you see people making to, you know, after, you know, obviously building up this company and four other companies, what are some big mistakes that you should tell people, you know, listen, step over this big pothole. Yeah. Yeah. Don't step in this one. And I've done 250 episodes of Built to Sell Radio now. So I've heard lots more than my own personal experience. Yeah. Yeah. Share any of those too. Yeah. yeah. What One of the, so there's two that come to mind. The first is a question that you're going to get at some point in your entrepreneurial journey, in particular from acquirers and potential investors. They're going to say, Hey, you know, Jeremy, no, like love the business you build. Like, why do you want to sell it? seems like a really innocuous question, but the answer to it is really important because when an acquirer looks at your company, the last thing they want to know is that you're stepping off a burning bridge, right? <laughs> they want to know that, right. that you're really excited about the future and that you need a strategic partner with deep strategic resources, financial resources, and other to help you achieve your goal. They're going to want to tie you in to some sort of earn out or uh, some sort of process so that you stay on for a couple of years and, and help them to monetize what they've acquired. And the last thing you want to do is stay, say stuff like, oh, I'm, I'm just tired. I'm, I, I'm kind of done, or I've got another idea I'm really excited about both of which might, by the way, might be true, but that's not what the acquirer wants to hear. They want to know. So, I mean, the coaching I would give you is, is, and again, it depends a little bit on the age of the entrepreneur. I, I think if you're 65, then for sure you can say, look, I'm, I'm getting to the age where I need to think about sort of um, my retirement and, and my own personal balance sheet. So while I've got lots of excitement about the future, um, I, I also want to kind of clean up my own personal balance sheet and make sure I'm not too exposed. So, you know, I'd, I'd be interested in selling part of, or, you know, whatever. So that's how, if I was 65, if I was 35, um, you know, I, I'd want to say more like, we've got a huge vision. Uh, we want to be the next Google, the next Tesla, the next Apple, whatever. Um, yeah. But really to achieve that, we need a partner. Yeah. We need someone who's got deep strategic resources. And, and so that's what we're looking for. Yeah. That's going to communicate that you're, that you're willing to stick around and that you've got a big vision. There's so an excitement there. Yeah. Like there's yeah. excitement for the future in both, in both respects. Not like I'm, I'm, I'm just tired of I'm 15 tired. years of this. I'm right. out, you know, Shitty customers <laughs> asking me for stuff all the time. Like, yeah, no, <laughs> but it may be true, but it's not the right answer. You know, thanks for sharing that because I think it's a it, it was a big mistake that in people have to listen to the book or read the book Built to Sell to hear how you walk through it in the book. Um, you know, the other part is sometimes people have to hear sales gone wrong, John, or horror stories to really have it hit home. Um, I'm wondering you know, after the fact, like during the due diligence process or after, what were some stories that you remember from either, you know, people you've interviewed or other, um, because I know you also have a lot of advisors as well, which I'd like to have you talk about the advisor uh, portion, but some horror stories when people enter into this process. Man, there's so many. It, <laughs> it is unfortunately a landmine uh, or a field full of landmines that, that you've got to really think about. I mean, I, I mean, a couple come to mind. Anna showed is uh, someone I had on built to sell radio about a month ago, wonderful entrepreneur, delightful woman. She's based in San Francisco. She got divorced and she moved to Portland in San Francisco. The fancy salad bar was a big deal. And so she thought, 
in Portland. There was no fancy salad bars at the time. And so she started one uh, called Garden Bar. And it was a success largely on her own sort of gumption and tenacity. She built it up to a successful business and a successful one location business. She gets approached by um, an acquirer who says, look, I, you know, I want, I've seen what you've created here. I, I, I want to help you build this into a, a huge brand. And, and I want to invest in your company. And so she is kind of enamored by this idea and taken sort of thinks it's great. And he puts together an investment port, uh, 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 sort of term sheet that says that he's going to get a 2x liquidity preference on exit. And she doesn't think much of it, but whatever. She, she goes ahead and signs it. Well, in the space of about 18 months, she, in fact, does build up Garden Bar into 10 locations across Portland, wow. only to attract an acquisition offer from the largest uh, sort of restaurant chain of its kind in Seattle, just up the road. She goes through the negotiation process about two days before closing. She turns to her lawyer and says, you do know that by doing this deal, you are going to be left penniless. And she says, what? And she says, yeah, you, you have a 2X liquidity preference on this investment, meaning the entire amount you're going to make from the sale of this company is going to go to the investor, not to you. And, and so again, she picked herself up off the floor, but she'd been growing so fast that they were starting to bleed cash, didn't have a lot of options left. And so she agreed to go ahead and sell the company mm. in return for an earn out, an earn out where you, set, you sign up for a set of goals in the future and that you're, you make you know, proceeds from your sale if you hit a set of goals. Well, that was in November, 2019. And everybody knows what happened to restaurants in February, 2020, three months later, they all got shut down, right? Because COVID hit right. and- she was left with nothing, nothing from building one of the fastest growing chains in Seattle, in uh, Portland. I mean, it's just a cautionary tale that a liquidity preference, a 2X liquidity or any sort of liquidity preference that investors would ask for are dangerous and they can end up washing you out of any sort of equity. That's one example. It's a very kind of a technical example. I want people not to be able to fall asleep at night, John, with these stories. That, that's what I want. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> What's another one like that, that people should <laughs> be weary of and maybe oh, lose yeah, sleep you, over? <laughs> sure. I mean, another one comes to mind again, built to sell a radio guest maybe a year ago, episode 150, something like that. You can just Google built to sell and the name Rand Fishkin. I think you've had Rand on the show. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, just an amazing entrepreneur uh, wrote a company called Lost, excuse me, wrote a book called Lost and Founder, which yeah. is definitely worth picking up if you yeah. haven't already. So Rand builds this company, Moz, SEO, uh, software tools, builds it up to about five and a half million in revenue, growing quickly, gets a call from Mark Halligan, good Chicago-based entrepreneur who owns HubSpot, co-owns HubSpot, co-founded HubSpot. Halligan says, look, I want Rand, I want to buy your company. And I want, to, I want to buy it for $25 million cash and HubSpot stock. Rand's like, oh my God, that's a lot of money. But he goes back to some of his advisors and says, you know what, Rand, you've been growing this business really quickly. You're expecting to double again next year. Fast growth SaaS company like yours would probably fetch four times revenue. That's 40 million bucks on next year's revenue if you're going to go from five to 10. I don't think 25 is enough. You should turn it down. And Rand listening to his advisor says, okay, yeah, I guess, you know, I'm going to turn it down. So he, told, he goes back to Halligan and says, look, I'm not taking your 25. I think it's worth 40. Halligan, in his case, looks at this business that's currently generating $5 million in revenue and says, like, there's no way and walks away. Rand decides instead to raise money, raise a bunch of venture capital money, has a liquidity preference. Ultimately, they diversify way outside of Rand's sweet spot and SEO tools to the tune that he gets a bit lost and the company starts to lose money. Each of the products he launches is less than successful than the last. He ultimately suffers a, a period of deep depression. He's removed as the CEO and the venture capitalists put in their own CEO. When I interviewed him on the show, I said, Rand, like, like, how, like what's your net worth now? And he said, you know, <laughs> believe, it or, believe it or not, my net worth is 800 grand. I have some shares in Moz, but because of the venture capitalist liquidity preference, I'm not sure they're worth anything. 
And oh, by the way, I'm about to spend most of that 800 grand on elder care for my grandparents who are in need of care. I said to Rand, out of interest, what would that offer from HubSpot look like today? And he said, based on the appreciation of HubSpot stock, it would be worth more than $100 million. Now, if that doesn't keep you up at night, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what would. It's a great book. If you haven't read it's, it, is good. it's great. It's certainly worth a read. And that's what I remember, not just the sale, but the, the stock, just yeah. because of HubSpot was worth a lot of money. Um, yeah. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that. I want to talk about, you know, on the site, there's a, maybe just we'll choose one. Um, there's, if they go, anyone goes to valuebuildersystem.com, you know, you can improve your value builder score with the value, value builder system. And there's 12 modules there. Um, and I wonder if we may like grab out one of them that you think would be good to talk about. You know, if you want to know about the envelope test, sorry, you're going to have to, you're just going to have to buy built to sell and like listen to it. You're not going to get that one. But um, because I love that part of the book too, with oh, cool. the, the envelope test. So yeah. you'll just have to get the book for that, um, for most of this. But um, which one you think would be most valuable to kind of pull out? I know you've talked about the hub and spoke is really important there. I don't know if that's the one you want to just, just highlight for a second. Yeah, I mean, we've already done a little bit of hum and spoke. It's just this notion yeah. that, that you need to build a business that's not dependent on you personally. And so, you know, think of it as a child you want to raise. Another one that, that maybe is a, a little less obvious that, that could be potentially more interesting about building value is the Switzerland structure. So it's, it's the name, the Switzerland structure is, is inspired by the country of Switzerland, which as you know, is, is kind of the punchline on a lot of jokes because they're so focused on independence, right? They're, you know, I want to be Switzerland, meaning I, I don't want to tip pick sides, right? So they didn't join either of the two world wars. They don't use the Euro. They didn't, this is blows my mind every time I think about it. They didn't even join the United Nations until they had a countrywide referendum as to whether to join. Like who doesn't join the United Nations? It's the most, you know, like every country practically is in the UN, but they had a countrywide referendum to decide whether to join because it meant that they were joining up with something. So it inspires this idea of creating a business that is not dependent on anything that would compromise its independence. So that would be any one customer, employee, or supplier. So you're looking to build a business that where a customer, no one customer exceeds any more than 15, 1-5% of your revenue. Uh, no employee is too irreplaceable. And no supplier, interestingly, is also too irreplaceable. And when you've got that, you've got a, a very, very solid foundation of a business. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I, I forgot who originated the statement, but I've heard it many times. The most dangerous number in business is one. And, and this is just kind of expanding on that. Like if it's a large chunk of whatever employee, you know, customer, you are in trouble at some point, you know? Yeah. 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 It's, it's another reason to lace a couple of these ideas together. It's another reason to go through the scalability trifecta. And it's another reason to focus on niching down because here's what I've experienced. Maybe Jeremy, you've, you've had some of the same experience as well. It, customers, when you deliver for them, when you really nail a project, they start asking for repeat projects, right? They say, wow, Jeremy really gets these. He's awesome. He really understands me. I'm going to ask him to do a second project and a third project. The only problem is that each time you really nail it for a customer, they can often start to widen the things that they want from you totally. to, the, <laughs> to the point that you're doing all sorts of stuff. You never imagined offering, you never imagined yeah. selling, but it's like the customer wants it, so I should be supplying it, right? And you build this business that's maybe growing in revenue, but becoming deeper and deeper, more dependent on both one customer and you personally to deliver for them. And so you, you reach a point where you've, you've got a profitable growing company that's worthless. And so the antidote to that, again, is to, is to think about what are you uniquely positioned to do? What can you teach employees to offer and what makes you, you valuable in offering it? and stick to your knitting. Even though customers will ask you for yeah. ancillary services, say, you know what? Our ability to nail this one product is because we can focus on it. And as soon as we take our eye off that, we're going to start disappointing you. Yep. Yep. Totally. And like the focus and discipline, it's hard to say no, but the focus and discipline is key. Um, I know we have a few more minutes and I wanted to touch on two things, um, John, is one, 
uh, the software and talk about yeah. the software. And the second is the advisor piece, which sure. I don't know if everyone knows how that works as well, because that is, you know, people helping deliver the message and the strategy and everything like that. So maybe talk about the software and the advisor piece. Yeah, you mentioned out of the gate that I've helped 55,000 business owners. That's a little generous. I personally haven't done that. The software has. You're a busy man. Yeah, we we have 55,000 users um, of the software whom are business owners going through the 12 modules I've described today to help them improve the value of their company. So that's the software. And we're mindful that what we do is highly, highly personal, right? The decision to sell, build value, uh, one day potentially exit, your company. It's just a deeply personal process. And, and so our go-to-market strategy is to partner with advisors whom business owners already trust, right? They already trust them with their most, you know, deepest, darkest secrets that we empower those advisors to offer the value builder system. So we license the system to advisors of which we have about a thousand around the world who use it as their platform for value building. So our business model is to license it to the advisors and advisors in turn uh, use it as their platform for value building advice that uh, they offer business owners. So people could check out the, if, if a business owner wants to check out and actually take the, um, sellability score. Um, can they go to valuabilitysystem.com slash score or do they have they to can. meet with an advisor? Yeah, no, you can go to value builder system. Uh, you can actually just go to value builder. It's a, it's a shortcut, uh, valuebuilder.com and you can get your score. Um, that will enable, that will trigger prices where you will get your score out of 100. Average score is 59. Those businesses on average are getting offers of 3.5 times pre-tax profit. If you are able to get your score all the way up to 90 out of a possible 100, those businesses on average are getting 7.1 times pre-tax profit, wow. more than double. So you can just get a sense of the range there, but you can first, the first step is to get your score. If you want, you'll then be prompted, do you want an advisor to help you interpret and grow your score? You can select yes, in which case we'll put you in touch with one of our certified value builders in your local area. And if someone... John, is a coach and they're interested in that advisor piece, where should they go to check out more on yeah, that? Yeah, same place, valuebuilder.com. And mm -hmm. there's a, a tab for advisors and they can check it out. Okay. John, always a pleasure. People should, you know, should check out Built to Sell, Automatic Customer. And I think you will have another book coming out um, in some point in the future too. So just Love search it. John Warlow on Amazon and Audible and just buy all of them. You know, let's just make it easy. All right. So- <laughs> You're very kind, Jeremy. Yeah. It's been, it's been yeah. a real pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Everyone check it out. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other.